Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Black Dog by Penelope Lively John Case came home one summer evening to find his wife huddled in the corner of the sofa with his sitting room curtains drawn. She said there was a black dog in the garden, looking at her through the window. Her husband put his briefcase in the hall and went outside. There was no dog. A blackbird fled shrieking across the lawn, and next door someone was using a mower. He did not see how any dog could get into the garden. The fences at either side were five feet high, and there was a wall at the far end. He returned to the house and pointed this out to his wife, who shrugged and continued to sit hunched in the corner of the sofa. He found her there again the next evening, and at the weekend she refused to go outside and sat for much of the time watching the window. The daughters came, big girls with jobs in insurance companies, wardrobes full of bright clothes and 20,000 pound mortgages. They stood over Brenda Case and said she should get out more. She should go to evening classes, they said. Join a health club, do a language course, learn upholstery, go jogging, take driving lessons. And Brenda Case sat at the kitchen table and nodded. She quite agreed. It would be a good thing to find a new interest. Jogging, upholstery, French. Yes, she said, she must pull herself together. And it was indeed up to her in the last resort. They were quite right. When they had gone, she drew the sitting room curtains again and sat on the sofa, staring at a magazine they had brought. The magazine was full of recipes the daughters had said she must try. There were huge, bright, glossy photographs of puddings crusted with alpine peaks of cream, of dark, glistening casseroles and salads like an artist's palette. The magazine costed each recipe. A four-course dinner for six weeks worked out to 3.89 pounds a head. It also had articles advising her on life insurance, treatment for breast cancer, and how to improve her lovemaking. John Case became concerned about his wife. She had always been a good housekeeper. Now they began to run out of things. When one evening there was nothing but cold meat and cheese for supper, he protested. She said she had not been able to shop because it had rained all day. On rainy days, the dog was always outside, waiting for her. The daughters came again and spoke severely to their mother. They talked to their father separately in different tones, proposing an autumn holiday in Portugal or the Canaries, a new three-piece for the sitting room, a mukwash coat. John Case discussed the whole thing with his wife, reasonably. He did this one evening after he had driven the Toyota into the garage, walked over to the front door, and found it locked from within. Brenda, opening it, apologized. The dog had been round at the front today, she said, sitting in the middle of the path. He began by saying lightly that dogs have not been known to stand up on their hind legs and open doors. And in any case, he continued, there is no dog, no dog at all. The dog is something you are imagining. I have asked all the neighbors. Nobody has seen a big black dog. Nobody around here owns a big black dog. There is no evidence of a dog. So you must stop going on about this dog because it does not exist. What is the matter, he asked gently. Something must be the matter. Would you like to go away for a holiday? Shall we have the house redecorated? Brenda Case listened to him. He was sitting on the sofa with his back to the window. She sat listening carefully to him, and from time to time her eyes strayed from his face to the lawn beyond, in the middle of which the dog sat, its tongue hanging out and its yellow eyes glinting. She said she would go away for a holiday if he wished, and she would be perfectly willing for the house to be redecorated. Her husband talked about travel agents and decorating firms, and once he got up and walked over to the window to inspect the condition of the paintwork, the dog Brenda saw continued to sit there, 
its eyes always on her. They went to Marrakesh for 10 days. Men came and turned the kitchen from Primrose to Eau de Nel, and the hallway from Magnolia to Parchment September became October, and Brenda Case fetched from the attic a big gnarled walking stick that was a relic of a trip to the Tyrol many years ago. She took this with her every time she went out of the house, which nowadays was not often inside the house. It was always somewhere near her, its end protruding from under the sofa or hooked over the arm of her chair. The daughters shook their tousled heads at their mother, towering over her in their baggy fashionable trousers and their big gay jackets. It's not fair on Dad, they said. Can't you see that? You've only got one life, they said sternly, and Brenda Case replied that she realized that she did indeed. Well then, said the daughters, one on each side of her bigger than her, brighter, louder, always saying what they meant, going straight to the point and no nonsense, competent with income tax returns and contemptuous of the muddle. When she was alone, Brenda Case kept doors and windows closed at all times. Occasionally, When the dog was not there, she would open the upstairs windows to air the bedrooms and the bathroom. She would stand with the curtain blowing, taking in great gulps and draughts. Downstairs, of course, she could not risk this because the dog was quite unpredictable. It would be absent all day, and then suddenly there would be squatting by the fence or leaning hard up against the patio doors, sprung from nowhere. She would draw the curtains, resigned, or move to another room and endure the knowledge of its presence on the other side of the wall, a few yards away. When it was there, she would sit doing nothing, staring straight ahead of her, silent and patient. When it was gone, she moved around the house, prepared meals, listened a little to the radio, and sometimes took the old photograph albums from the bottom drawer of the bureau in the sitting room. In these albums, the daughters slowly mutated from swaddled bundles topped with monkey faces and spiky hair to chunky toddlers and then to spindly limbed little girls in matching pinafores. They played on Cornish beaches or posed on the lawn, holding her hand, that same lawn on which the dog now sat on its hunkers. In the photographs, she looked down on them smiling and they gazed up at her or held out objects for her inspection, a flower, a seashell. Her husband was also in the photographs, a smaller man than now, it seemed, with a curiously vulnerable look, as though surprised in a moment of privacy. Looking at herself, Brenda saw a pretty young woman who seemed vaguely familiar, like some relative not encountered for many years. John Case realized that nothing had been changed by Marrakesh and redecorating. He tried putting the walking stick back up in the attic. His wife brought it down again. If he opened the patio door, she would simply close them as soon as he left the room. Sometimes he saw her looking over his shoulder into the garden with an expression on her face that chilled him. He asked her one day what she thought the dog would do if it got into the house. She was silent for a moment and then said quietly she supposed it would eat her. He said he could not understand. He simply did not understand what could be wrong. It was not, he said, as though they had a thing to worry about. He gently pointed out that she wanted for nothing. It's not that we have to count the pennies anymore, he said. Not like in the old days. When we were young, said Brenda Case, when the girls were babies. Right. It's not like that now, is it? He indicated a 24-inch color TV set, the video, the stereo, the microwave oven, the English rose-fitted kitchen, the bathroom with separate showers. He reminded her of the BUPA membership, the index-linked pension, the shares and dividends. Brenda agreed that it was not. It most certainly was not. The daughters came with their boyfriends, nicely spoken, confident young men in very clean shirts, who talked to Brenda of their work in firms selling computers and Japanese cameras while the girls took John into the garden and discussed their mother. The thing is, she's becoming agoraphobic. She thinks she sees this black dog, said John Case. We know, said the eldest daughter, but that, frankly, is neither here nor there. It's a mechanism, simply. A ploy, like children do. One has to get to the root of it. That's the thing. 
it's her age, said the youngest. Of course it's her age, snorted the eldest, but it's also her. She was always inclined to be negative. But this is ridiculous. Negative, said John Case. He tried to remember his wife, his wives, who? One of whom he could see inside the house, beyond the glass of the patio window, looking out at him from between two young men he barely knew. The reflections of his daughters, his strapping prosperous daughters, were superimposed upon their mother so that she looked at him through the cerise and orange and yellow of their clothes. Negative. A warrior. Look on the bright side, I say. But that's not mom, is it? I wouldn't have said, he began. She's unmotivated, said the youngest. That's the real trouble. No job, no nothing. It's a generation problem, too. I'm trying, their father began. We know, Dad. We know. But the thing is, she needs help. This isn't something you can handle all on your own. She'll have to see someone. No way, said the youngest. Will we get Mum into therapy? Dad can take her to the surgery, said the eldest. For starters, the doctor, the new doctor, there was always a new doctor, was about the same age as her daughters. Brenda Case saw. Once upon a time, doctors had been older men, fatherly and reliable. This one was good-looking, in the manner of men in knitting pattern photographs. He sat looking at her quite kindly, and she told him how she was feeling, insofar as this was possible. When she had finished, he tapped a pencil on his desk. Yes, he said, yes, I see. And then he went on. There doesn't seem to be any specific trouble, does there, Mrs. Case? She agreed. How do you think you would define it yourself? She thought. At last she said that she supposed there was nothing wrong with her that wasn't wrong with, well, everyone. Quite, said the doctor busily, writing now on his pad. That's the sensible way to look at things. So I'm giving you this three a day. Come back and see me in two weeks. When she had come out, John Case asked to see the doctor for a moment. He explained that he was worried about his wife. The doctor nodded sympathetically. John told the doctor about the black dog, apologetically, and the doctor looked reflective for a moment and then said, Your wife is 54. John Case agreed she was indeed 54. Exactly, said the doctor, so I think we can take it that with some care and understanding, these difficulties will disappear. I've given her something, he said confidently. John Case smiled back. That was that. It will go away, said John Case to his wife firmly. He was not entirely sure what he meant, but it did not do, he felt sure, to be irresolute. She looked at him without expression. Brenda Case swallowed each day the pills that the doctor had given her. She believed in medicines and doctors, but always found that aspirin cured a headache and used to frequent the surgery with the girls when they were small. She was prepared for a miracle. For the first few days, it did seem to her just possible that the dog was growing a little smaller, but after a week, she realized that it was not. She continued to take the pills, and when at the end of a fortnight, she told the doctor that there was no change, he said that these things took time. One had to be patient. She looked at him. This young man in his swivel chair on the other side of a cluttered desk and knew that whatever was to be done would not be done by him or by cheerful yellow pills like children's sweets. The daughters came to inspect and admonish. She said that yes, she had seen the doctor again and yes, she was feeling rather more herself. She showed them the new sewing machine with many extra attachments that she had not used and when they left she watched them go down the front path to their cars swinging their bags and shouting at each other, and saw the dog step aside for them, wagging its tail. When they had gone, she opened a door again and stood there for a few minutes, looking at it, and a dog, five yards away, looked back, not moving. The next day, she took the shopping trolley and set off for the shops. As she opened the front gate, she saw the dog come out from the shadow of the fence, but she did not turn back. She continued down the street, although she could feel it behind her, keeping its distance. She spoke in a friendly way to a couple of neighbors, did her shopping, and returned to the house. And all the while, the dog was there, 20 paces off. As she walked to the front door, she could hear the click of its claws on the pavement, 
and had to steel herself so hard not to turn around that when she got inside, she was bathed in sweat and shaking all over. When her husband came home that evening, he thought her in a funny mood. She asked for a glass of sherry, and later she suggested they put a record on instead of watching TV. West Side Story, or another of those shows they went to years ago. He was surprised at the change in her. She began to go out daily, and although in the evenings she often appeared to be exhausted, as though she had been climbing mountains instead of walking suburban streets, she was curiously calm. Admittedly, she had not appeared agitated before, but her stillness had not been natural. Now he sensed the difference. When the daughter's telephone, he reported their mother's condition and listened to their complacent comments. That stuff usually did the trick, they said. All the medics were using it nowadays. They'd always known mom would be okay soon. But when he put the telephone down and returned to his wife in the sitting room, he found himself looking at her uncomfortably. There was an alertness about her that worried him. Later he thought he heard something outside and went to look. He could see nothing at either the front or the back, and his wife continued to read a magazine. When he sat down again, she looked across at him with a faint smile. She had started by meeting its eyes, its yellow eyes, and thus she had learned that she could stop it, halt its patient shadowing of her leaving it sitting on the pavement or the garden path. She began to leave the front door ajar to open the patio window. She could not say what would happen next, knew only this was inevitable. She no longer sweated or shook. She did not glance behind her when she was outside, and within she hummed to herself as she moved from room to room. John Case, returning home on an autumn evening, stepped out of the car and saw light streaming through the open front door. He thought he heard his wife speaking to someone in the house. Then he came into the kitchen, though she was alone, he said. The front door was open, and she replied that she must have left it so by mistake. She was busy with a saucepan at the stove, and in the corner of the room her husband saw was a large dog basket towards which her glance occasionally strayed. He made no comment. He went back into the hall, hung up his coat, and was startled suddenly by his own face, caught unaware in the mirror by the hat stand and seeming like someone else's, that of a man both older and more burdened than he knew himself to be. He stood staring at it for a few moments and then took a step back towards the kitchen. He could hear the gentle, chunking sound of his wife's wooden spoon stirring something in the saucepan and then he thought the creak of wicker work. He turned sharply and went into the sitting room. He crossed to the window and looked out. He saw the lawn, blackish in the dusk, disappearing into darkness. He switched on the outside lights and flooded it all with an artificial glow. The grass, the little flight of steps up to the patio and the flower bed at the top of them, from which he had tidied away the spent summer annuals at the weekend. The bare earth was marked all over. He now saw with what appeared to be animal footprints. And as he stood gazing, it seemed to him that he heard the pad of paws on the carpet behind. He stood for a long while before at last he turned around. Number 17 by Edith Nesbitt. I yawned. I could not help it. But the flat, inexorable voice went on. Speaking from the journalistic point of view, I may tell you, gentlemen, that I once occupied the position of advertisement editor to the Bradford Woolen Goods Journal. And speaking from that point of view, I hold the opinion that all the best ghost stories have been written over and over again. And if I were to leave the road and return to a literary career, I should never be led away by ghosts. Realism's what's wanted nowadays, if you want to be up to date. The large commercial pause for breath. You can never tell with the public, said the lean elderly traveler. It's like in the fancy business. You never know how it's going to be, whether it's a clockwork ostrich or samite silk or a particular shape of shaded glass novelty or tobacco box got up to look like a raw chop. You never know your luck. That depends on who you are, said the dapper man in the corner by the fire. If you've got the right push about you, you can make things go, whether it's a clockwork kitten or imitation meat. And with stories, 
I take it it's just the same. Realism or ghost stories. But the best ghost story would be the realist one. I think the large commercial had got his breath. I don't believe in ghost stories myself, he was saying with earnest dullness, but there was rather a queer thing happened to a second cousin of an aunt of mine by marriage. A very sensible woman with no nonsense about her and the soul of truth and honor. I shouldn't have believed it if she had been one of your flighty, fanciful sorts. Don't tell us the story, said the melancholy man who traveled in hardware. You'll make us afraid to go to bed. The well-met effort failed. The large commercial went on, as I had known he would. His words overflowed his mouth as his person overflowed his chair. I turned my mind to my own affairs, coming back to the commercial room in time to hear the summing up. The doors were all locked, and she was quite certain she saw a tall white figure glide past her and vanish. I wouldn't have believed it if... And so on, da capo. From if she hadn't been the second cousin to the soul of truth and honor, I yawned again. Very good story, said the smart little man by the fire. He was a traveler, as the rest of us were. His presence in the room told us that much. He had been rather silent during dinner, and afterwards, while the red curtains were being drawn and the red and black cloth laid between the glasses and the decanters and the mahogany, he had quietly taken the best chair in the warmest corner. We had got our letters written, and the large traveler had been boring us for some time before I even noticed that there was a best chair and that this silent, bright-eyed, dapper, fair man had secured it. A very good story, he said, but it's not what I call realism. You don't tell us half enough, sir. You don't say when it happened or where, or the time of year, or what color your aunt's second cousin's hair was. Nor yet you don't tell us what it was she saw, nor what the room was like where she saw it, nor why she saw it, nor what happened afterwards. And I shouldn't like to breathe a word against anybody's aunt by marriage's cousin, first or second. But I must say, I like a story about what's a man seen himself. So do I, the large commercial snorted. When I hear it, he blew his nose like a trumpet of defiance. But, said the rabbit-faced man, we know nowadays, what with the advance of science and all that sort of thing, we know there aren't any such things as ghosts. They're hallucination. That's what they are, hallucinations. Don't seem to matter what you call them, the dapper one urged, if you see a thing that looks as real as you do yourself, a thing that makes your blood run cold and turns you sick and silly with fear. Well, call it ghost, or call it hallucination, or call it Tommy Dodd. It isn't the name that matters. The elderly commercial coughed and said, you might call it another name. You might call it... No, you mightn't, said the little man briskly. Not when the man it happened to had been a teetotal bond of joy for five years and is to this day. Why don't you tell us the story, I asked. I might be willing, he said, if the rest of the company were agreeable. Only, I warn you, it's not that sort of kind of a somebody fancied they saw a sort of a kind of a something sort of story. No, sir. Everything I'm going to tell you is plain and straightforward and as clear as a timetable. Clearer than some. But I don't much like telling it, especially to people who don't believe in ghosts. Several of us said we did believe in ghosts. The heavy man snorted and looked at his watch. And the man in the best chair began. Turn the gas down a bit, will you? Thanks. Did any of you know Herbert Hatteras? He was on this road a good many years. No? Well, never mind. He was a good chap, I believe, with good teeth and a black whisker. But I didn't know him myself. He was before my time. Well, this that I'm going to tell you about happened at a certain commercial hotel. I'm not going to give it a name because that sort of thing gets about. And in every other respect, it is a good house and reasonable, and we all have our living to get. It was just a good, ordinary, old-fashioned commercial hotel, as it might be this, and I've often used it since, though they've never put me in that room again. Perhaps they shut it up after what happened. Well, the beginning of it was, I came across an old school fellow in Boulder's Lock one Sunday, 
It was, I remember, Jones was his name, Ted Jones. We both had canoes, we had tea at Marlow, and we got talking about this and that and old times and old mates and do you remember Jim and what became of Tom and so on. Well, you know. And I happened to ask after his brother, Fred by name, and Ted turned pale and almost dropped his cup and he said, You don't mean to say you haven't heard? No, says I, mopping up the tea he'd slopped over with my handkerchief. No, what? I said. It was horrible, he said. They wired for me and I saw him afterwards. Whether he'd done it himself or not, nobody knows. But they found him lying on the floor with his throat cut. No cause could be assigned for the rash act, Ted told me. I asked him where it had happened, and he told me the name of this hotel. I'm not going to name it. And when I'd sympathized with him and drawn him out about old times, and poor old Fred being such a good old sort and all that, I asked him what the room was like. I always like to know what the places look like where things happen. No, there wasn't anything specially rum about the room, only that it had a French bed with red curtains and a sort of alcove and a large mahogany wardrobe as big as a hearse with a glass door and instead of a swing glass, a carved black framed glass screwed up against the wall between the windows and a picture of Belshazzar's feast over the mantelpiece. I beg your pardon? He stopped, for the heavy commercial had opened his mouth and shut it again. I thought you were going to say something. The dapper man went on. Well, we talked about other things and parted, and I thought no more about it till business brought me to. But I'd better not name the town either. And I found my firm had marked this very hotel where poor Fred had met his death, you know, for me to put up at. And I had to put up there, too, because of their addressing everything to me there. And anyhow, I expect I should have gone there out of curiosity. No, I didn't believe in ghosts in those days. I was like you, sir, he nodded amiably to the large commercial. The house was very full and we were quite a large party in the room. Very pleasant company, as it might be tonight. And we got talking of ghosts, just as it might be us. And there was a chap in glasses, sitting just over there, I remember. An old hand on the road, he was. And he said, just as it might be any of you, I don't believe in ghosts, and I wouldn't care to sleep in number 17 for all that. And of course, we asked him why. Because, said he very short, that's why. But when we persuaded him a bit, he told us, because that's the room where chaps cut their throats, he said. There was a chap called Bert Hatteras began it. They found him weltering in his gore. And since that, every man that slept there has been found with his throat cut. I asked him how many had slept there. Well, only two beside the first, he said. They shut it up then. Oh, did they? said I. Well, they've opened it again. Number 17's my room. I tell you, those chaps looked at me. But you aren't going to sleep in it, one of them said. And I explained that I didn't pay a half a dollar for a bedroom to keep awake in. I suppose its press of business has made them open it up again. The chap in spectacles said, It's a very mysterious affair. There's some secret horror about the room that we don't understand, he said. And I'll tell you another queer thing. Every one of those poor chaps was a commercial gentleman. That's what I don't like about it. There was Bert Hatteras. He was the first, and a chap called Jones, Frederick Jones, and then Donald Overshaw, a Scotsman he was, and traveled in child's underclothing. Well, we sat there and talked a bit, and I hadn't been a bond of joy. I don't know what I might have exceeded, gentlemen. Yes, positively exceeded. For the more I thought about it, the less I liked the thought of number 17. I hadn't noticed the room particularly, except to see that the furniture had been changed since poor Fred's time. So I just slipped out by and by, and I went out to the little glass case under the arch where the booking clerk sits, just like here the hotel was, and I said, Look here, miss, haven't you another room empty except 17? No, she said, I don't think so. Then what's that? I said and pointed to a key hanging on the board. The only one left. Oh, she said, that's 16. Anyone in 16, I said, 
Is it a comfortable room? No, said she. Yes, quite comfortable. It's next door to yours. Much the same class of room. Then I'll have sixteen, if you'll have no objections, I said, and went back to the others, feeling very clever. When I went up to bed, I locked my door, and though I didn't believe in ghosts, I wish seventeen wasn't next door to me, and I wish there wasn't a door between the two rooms, though the door was locked right enough and the key on my side. I'd only got the one candle besides the two on the dressing table, which I hadn't lighted, and I got my collar and tie off before I noticed that the furniture in my new room was the furniture out of number 17. French bed with red curtains, mahogany wardrobe as big as a hearse, and the carved mirror over the dressing table between the two windows and Belshazzar's feast over the mantelpiece. So that, though I'd not got the room where the commercial gentleman had cut their throats, I'd got the furniture out of it. And for a moment I thought that was worse than the other. When I thought of what that furniture could tell, if it could speak, it was a silly thing to do. But we're all friends here, and I don't mind owning up. I looked under the bed, and I looked inside the hearse wardrobe, and I looked in a sort of narrow cupboard there was where a body could have stood upright. A body, I repeated. A man, I mean. You see, it seemed to me that either these poor chaps had been murdered by someone who hid himself in number 17 to do it, or else there was something there that frightened them into cutting their throats. And upon my soul, I can't tell you which idea I liked least. He paused and filled his pipe very deliberately. Go on, someone said, and he went on. Now, you'll observe, he said, that all I've told you up to the time of my going to bed that night, just hearsay, so I don't ask you to believe it, though the three corners inquest would be enough to stagger most chaps, I should say. Still, what I'm going to tell you now is my part of the story, what happened to me myself in that room. He paused again, holding the pipe in his hand, unlighted. There was a silence, which I broke. Well, what did happen, I asked. I had a bit of a struggle with myself, he said. I reminded myself it was not that room, but the next one that it had happened in. I smoked a pipe or two and read the morning paper, advertisements and all, and at last I went to bed. I left the candle burning, though I owned that. Did you sleep? I asked. Yes, I slept. Sound as a top. I was awakened by a soft tapping on my door. I sat up. I don't think I've ever been so frightened in my life, but I made myself say, who's there, in a whisper. Heaven knows, I never expected anyone to answer. The candle had gone out, and it was pitch dark. There was a quiet murmur and a shuffling sound outside, and no one answered. I tell you, I hadn't expected anyone to. But I cleared my throat and cried out, Who's there? in a real out loud voice. And me, sir, said a voice. Shaving water, sir, six o'clock, sir. It was the chambermaid. A movement of relief ran around our circle. I don't think much of your story, said the large commercial. You haven't heard it yet, said the storyteller dryly. It was six o'clock on a winter's morning and pitch dark. My train went at seven. I got up and began to dress. My one candle wasn't much use. I lighted the two on the dressing table to see if to shave by. There wasn't any shaving water outside my door, after all, and the passage was as black as a coal hole. So I started to shave with cold water. One has to sometimes, you know. I got over my face and I was just going lightly round under my chin when I saw something move in the looking glass. I mean, something that moved was reflected in the looking glass. The big door of the wardrobe had swung open, and by a sort of double reflection, I could see the French bed with a red curtain. On the edge of it sat a man in his shirt and trousers, a man with black hair and whiskers, with the most awful look of despair and fear on his face that I've ever seen or dreamt of. I stood paralyzed, watching him in the mirror, I could not have turned round to save my life. Suddenly he laughed. It was a hard, silent laugh, and showed all his teeth. They were very white and even, and the next moment 
He had cut his throat from ear to ear, there before my eyes. Did you ever see a man cut his throat? The bed was all white before. The storyteller had laid down his pipe and he passed his hand over his face before he went on. When I could look round, I did. There was no one in the room. The bed was as white as ever. Well, that's all, he said abruptly, except that now, of course, I understood how these poor chaps had come by their deaths. They'd all seen this horror, the ghost of the first poor chap, I suppose, Bert Hatteras, you know, and with a shock their hands must have slipped and their throats got cut before they could stop themselves. Oh, by the way, when I looked at my watch, it was two o'clock. There hadn't been any chambermaid at all. I must have dreamt that, but I didn't dream the other. Oh, and one more thing. It was the same room. They hadn't changed the room. They'd only changed the number. It was the same room. Look here, said the heavy man. The room you've been talking about. My room's 16. And it's got that same furniture in it as what you describe and the same picture and all. Oh, has it? Said the storyteller. A little uncomfortable, it seemed. I'm sorry, but the cat's out of the bag now and it can't be helped. Yes, it was this house I was speaking of. I suppose they've opened the room again, but you don't believe in ghosts. You'll be all right. Yes, said the heavy man, and presently got up and left the room. He's gone to see if he can get his room changed. You see, if he hasn't, said the rabbit-faced man, and I don't wonder. The heavy man came back and settled into his chair. I could do with a drink, he said, reaching to the bell. I'll stand some punch, gentlemen, if you'll allow me said our dapper storyteller. I rather pride myself on my punch. I'll step out to the bar and get what I need for it. I thought he said he was a teetotaler, said the heavy traveler when he had gone, and when our voices buzzed like a hive of bees, when our storyteller came in again, we turned on him, half a dozen of us at once, and spoke. One at a time, he said gently. I didn't quite catch what you said. We want to know, I said, how it was, if seeing that ghost made all those chaps cut their throats by startling them when they were shaving, how was it you didn't cut your throat when you saw it? I should have, he answered gravely, without the slightest doubt. I should have cut my throat only, he glanced at our hairy friend. I always shave with a safety razor. I travel in them, he added slowly and bisected a lemon. But, but, said the large man, when he could speak through our uproar. I've gone and given up my room. Yes, said the dapper man, squeezing the lemon. I've just had my things moved into it. It's the best room in the house. I always think it's worthwhile to take a little pains to secure it.